Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Vignes Warren. I'm a neurosurgeon and assistant professor at the Vivian L. Smith Department of Neurosurgery uh, in the UT Health uh, Neurosciences Group. It's affiliated with the McGovern Medical School in UT Houston. Um, I'm part of a group of neurosurgeons that treat patients diagnosed with various brain tumors, and our subspecialty focus is neurosurgical oncology. I see patients in the Houston area spanning from Sugarland to Southwest Houston and the Texas Medical Center. And today I'm going to give a brief introduction to the diagnosis and management of brain metastasis. As we know, as the American population ages and as the diagnosis for cancer continues to be one that we are working to cure, the development of brain metastasis and the management of this disease process is of utmost importance. And our group at UT Health Neurosciences is dedicated to providing patient-centric care that focuses on a good quality of life and good outcomes derived from a multidisciplinary care model involving oncologists, neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, and neurologists. So what exactly are brain metastases? In the brain, you can develop two types of brain tumors, those that are of the brain and from the brain, which we consider primary glial tumors, or those that are secondary and spread to the brain. These are lesions that occur in the brain when cancer cells break off from their original site and spread to the brain either through the blood bloodstream or lymphatic system. And once in the brain, they can seed and develop lesions that can occupy space and push on the normal and adjacent brain tissue, or they can leach into the cerebral spinal fluid, causing a disease process called leptomeningeal disease. As these lesions grow, they then start to cause pressure on the brain, and that pressure results in the symptoms that patients often start to experience and come to the hospital with. Some of the symptoms that are associated with brain metastasis are specific to where the lesion occurs. In general, because this is a space-occupying lesion, it increases the pressure in the head, and so headaches are a very common form of presentation. If the lesion were to develop in the frontal lobe, someone may expect changes in personality. Um, people may become more erratic or have a difficult time uh, controlling their emotions. Seizures are also a very common way that these present. Uh, most of the time, a patient may have a first time new seizure, and then after getting a scan completed of their head, it may be identified that there is a brain lesion there that may be resulted from a brain metastasis. If the lesion is adjacent to or involving the parts of the brain that involve the movement of the body and the arm or the leg, this can result in weakness on one side of the body. Oftentimes, patients may present to the emergency room with a concern for a stroke, but once this has been evaluated and ruled out, we may then identify other causes for the weakness, one of that being a brain metastasis. If the lesion is located in the temporal lobe, there may be difficulty with processing speech, producing speech, reading or writing. And ultimately, if these lesions land in the cerebellum or near the drainage system of the brain's cerebral spinal fluid, it can cause the development of obstructive hydrocephalus or a difficulty with outflow of cerebral spinal fluid from the head, leading to increased intracranial pressure. This can sometimes be a emergency type situation where patients are brought to the emergency room and this is identified. Rarely do we find metastatic diseases that have implanted into the ventricular system and sometimes they may have already seeded through the spinal fluid in leptomeningeal disease. So where exactly do these brain metastases come from and how common are they? Currently, they are the most common type of brain lesion that we identify in the field of neurosurgical oncology. It's estimated that up to about 200,000 people are diagnosed with some form of a brain metastasis each year. This number is likely underrepresented in that there are patients that may have developed terminal cancers and we never got around to imaging their brain, and so we may not truly know how many patients go on to develop brain metastasis later on in their cancer pathway. 
However, it is estimated that about 20% of patients with cancer will develop brain metastases, and as our treatments for cancer continue to improve, patients are living longer with a cancer diagnosis, and that makes it more likely than the future they may develop a brain metastasis, which remains difficult to treat. The most common types of cancers that metastasize to the brain are lung cancers, breast cancers, followed by colon, kidney, and melanomas. Lung and breast cancers have very specific subtypes that we've recently identified that have a higher propensity to spread to the brain that harbor certain mutations in the ALK gene or ALK gene in non-small cell lung cancer, or in those patients who are diagnosed with a HER2 amplified or triple negative breast cancer, those types of breast cancers have a higher tendency to metastasize to the brain. Ultimately, the treatment that patients receive for their primary cancer, whether it be lung, breast, colon, kidney, or the melanoma, is sufficient to treat that primary site. Many of the treatments that are used to treat lung, breast, colon, kidney, and melanoma are chemotherapeutics that are effective in treating these primary cancers. However, when they do metastasize to the brain, those treatments fail to cross the blood-brain barrier. And because of this, they are no longer effective. And there are new treatments that need to be identified and discussed with specialists who focus on the neurosciences and neurosurgical oncology specifically. How are these brain metastases first diagnosed? Well. Most of the times, a patient will have a primary oncologist who is managing their breast, colon, lung, or other malignancy, and may come to them at some point in their treatment or later on and discuss new neurological symptoms that may prompt a imaging study, such as a MRI study that's conducted with contrast or a PET scan. And the longer a patient lives with a certain malignancy, the risk of them developing a brain metastasis may increase. However, currently there are no guidelines requiring screening of the brain for metastasis after a diagnosis. Because of the rarity of this disease process, it still remains one that we monitor for based primarily off of those symptoms that we discussed before and a careful discussion with your oncologist. Commonly, in the process of doing a PET scan or restaging a cancer, imaging of the brain may be completed, in which case we incidentally find these lesions. As our imaging modalities have gotten more detailed, we're able to catch lesions much earlier, and when we do identify an abnormality in the brain, we then are posed with the question of how do we further analyze this radiographic abnormality. Sometimes we're as neurosurgeons ask to perform a brain biopsy to get a piece of that abnormal lesion that we see on the MRI, which we, then, we can then study histologically with the help of our pathologists in order to determine whether or not this is a concern for malignancy. Sometimes if there's evidence on the MRI studies of possible disease that has spread into the spinal fluid, such as the leptomeningeal disease, a lumbar puncture may be carried out in order to sample spinal fluid to look for these cancer cells in the fluid itself. There are certain factors that influence the prognosis for a patient diagnosed with a brain metastasis. First and foremost is age. Uh, as, as we know, the, our patient population that tends to develop brain metastases are usually in the median age of 50s to 70s. And the older our patients get, the prognosis does get worse simply because of the extent of time that they've had disease and the more likelihood that they've developed disease elsewhere in their body, not just in the primary site of the cancer. If that is the case, the degree of primary disease control is important. If a patient has lung cancer that has unfortunately spread to other organ systems, including the brain, their prognosis is not as good as a patient who may have primary lung cancer that's been treated and has not spread to anywhere else, and then incidentally later on is found to have a brain metastasis, if their disease burden is low, their prognosis is much better. The patient's performance status is also important to keep in mind. This means the ability for that patient to carry out tasks of normal daily living and their ability to handle both the treatment that comes along for brain metastasis and the recovery period afterward. 
Also, in cases of recurrence or in cases where patients have had prior surgeries or radiation and chemotherapy, these can all play into the prognosis. And now, as next generation sequencing, genomic analysis, and mutational studies are being completed, we can identify novel tumor subtypes that can have a more favorable prognosis when coupled with unique patient-centric tailored treatments. As far as treatments go, the question of what is available for treatment for brain metastasis falls into three buckets. There's the neurosurgical treatment, the radiation treatment managed by our radiation oncologists, and the targeted chemotherapeutic treatments managed by our neuro-oncologists. Here at UT Health Houston, in the McGovern Medical School, as part of our neurosciences group, we have a large interdisciplinary group that have specialists in each of these fields that meet weekly to discuss every patient case and come up with a treatment plan that generally involves all three of these branches. The Brain Tumor Center, and specifically the metastatic component of the Brain Tumor Center, looks carefully at each patient and determines whether or not there is a surgical option, whether or not they need any further radiation or what type of radiation specifically, and then whether the patient is eligible for any clinical trials or if their tumor type is relevant to a certain immunotherapy or targeted therapy that has come to light. As far as the neurosurgical care for patients with brain metastasis go, our group at UT Health Neurosciences is specialized in performing minimally invasive stereotactic guided surgeries. These types of procedures allow for us to perform smaller incisions, smaller craniotomies, which lead to less downtime for the patient, faster healing, and a quicker turnaround to their remaining treatment, which would be radiation and chemotherapy. This also helps maintain a good performance status for the patient so that they're still able to get to and from their further appointments and minimizes the scar and the healing time. Demonstrated here are some of the novel approaches that we take to removing brain tumors in accessible regions using smaller incisions, such as an eyebrow craniotomy or smaller keyhole craniotomies, and using port-assisted surgical devices to allow us to get to deep-seated tumors using a small port, which can be placed down to where the tumor resides, and then resecting the tumor using an intraoperative microscope with high magnification and bright illumination to safely resect the tumor from the surrounding normal brain tissue. Another form of neurosurgical treatment that we perform at UT Health is the use of laser interstitial thermal therapy for some deep-seated brain tumors that cannot be reached via the traditional surgical approach or with port-assisted surgery. We are able to place a cannula directly down to the site of the lesion Typically, a biopsy is performed at the same time, and then through this access port, a fiber is passed down that has a laser tip, which allows us to burn and use thermal properties to destroy the tumor. What you see here is a schematic of that process occurring. This is completed in a modified surgical suite where a MRI is also done at the same time using real-time MR thermography so we can watch the gradient of heat that develops around the lesion as the ablation is completed. Our partners in the Department of Radiation Oncology and specifically in the Neurosurgery Department with Neuroradiation Oncology will perform stereotactic radiosurgery, sometimes as the first line of treatment if the lesions are small and not amenable to surgery or if the lesions are numerous and not amenable to surgery. Stereotactic radiosurgery can be completed using a variety of platforms which are all available through our group, including the Gamma Knife, Lexel unit, and CyberKnife, and IMRT. Additionally, we have resources for providing whole brain radiation therapy and brachytherapy that also come through our department and our collaboration with the radiation oncology team. Finally, the third arm in our treatment are our partners in neuro-oncology who after a combination of either surgery, surgery plus radiation or radiation alone, 
will then start patients on some form of targeted therapy or immunotherapy that may be relevant to their unique tumor type, identify clinical trials that the patient may be available to register in, and in some cases where a patient may have disseminated disease, such as leptomeningeal disease, our neuro-oncologists will ask us as neurosurgeons to implant a special type of chemotherapeutic port that has a reservoir and a catheter tube that goes into the ventricles or the fluid-filled spaces of the brain to deliver intrathecal chemotherapy as opposed to the traditional chemotherapy ports that are placed into the veins to allow for administration of medication to the bloodstream. This combination of treatment, including surgery, radiation, and chemotherapeutics, is necessary in treating patients with brain metastases since every patient is unique and different, and not all treatments are going to align specifically for one patient versus another. Which brings us to our final point, which is which treatment do we choose? Though there may be some algorithms, as displayed here, that try to help in our decision-making, determining whether or not a patient should receive surgery with radiation, surgery with whole brain radiation, just radiation, just chemotherapeutics. There's a whole host of factors that play into our surgical decision-making, our radiation decision-making, and our chemotherapeutic choices. These decisions are discussed at our weekly tumor board meetings in an, inter in an interdisciplinary fashion so that all the treating parties are able to advocate for the patient and come up with a treatment paradigm that is going to be safe and effective, and most importantly, centered around what the family and their primary oncologist would want. Many of our patients come to us from a primary oncologist who may not be in the UT Health Group, who has been managing a patient for many years with breast cancer or melanoma, lung cancer or a colon cancer and are trusting our group to then take over the neurological care of this patient. Our intention is to do that and return the patient back to the primary oncologist for continuation of care while remaining a specialized team always available to help at any instant. The family discussion with our group and the family discussion with the oncologist and the overall picture for what the patient would want lies in our discussion centered on goals of care and quality of life. With keeping these two guiding principles in mind, our tumor board works diligently to make sure that we're always selecting the appropriate patients and the appropriate treatments in this very difficult to manage and care for population with brain metastatic disease. Please feel free to reach out to our UT Health Neurosciences group or any further questions and to make an appointment, please contact our organization through the Brain Tumor Center found from our website. Thank you.